Last they saw of Perth, she was, um, they said she steamed out. Actually, she didn't sink, she steamed out. And they could see this glimpse of the, of the red, white and blue Navy ensign lit by the Japanese searchlights, and then she was gone. The sun rose on the next morning on this sea of, of bodies, of, uh, of flotsam and jetsam, wreckage, and men struggling to stay alive. Some of them grievously wounded. I mean, c quite a few died in, uh, in the arms of their mates. Others simply vanished. There was a, there's a very strong current that sweeps down the Sunda Strait. It sweeps at about maybe eight kilometres an hour. It's quite fast and strong. And many of those guys, many of the ship's company, were simply swept out to die in the empty wastes of the Indian Ocean. Some of them managed to struggle on... Some of them found a lifeboat and managed to struggle on board that, an old Japanese lifeboat they'd found. Others somehow managed to swim to a few of the islands that are in the Sunda Strait. Although, again, many of them didn't make it. They were literally within, within metres of an island when the current would pick them up and sweep them out and, uh, and on down to the Indian Ocean. So a good many of those... those Men, men died on that first day. You're listening to Conversations with Richard Feidler. On ABC Local Radio and the World Wide Web. You're listening to a conversation I had with journalist and broadcaster Mike Carlton in front of a live audience at the State Library of Queensland. Mike is talking about his book, Cruiser, The Life and Loss of HMAS Perth and Her Crew. HMAS Perth was sunk in 1942 after fighting a desperate battle against a Japanese fleet. And Mike spoke to many of the survivors of Perth and their families. What happened to the captain, Hector Waller? Waller was, Waller was last seen on the bridge. His guns were silent. There are only three left on the bridge at the last moment. Waller and um, the gunnery officer and uh, the officer of the watch, a fellow called Willie Gay. And Gay turned to the gunnery officer, Hancock, and he said... Um, we should get off the bridge, we've been told to go. What about the captain? And the gunnery officer said, no, he won't come. And Waller turned round to the two young officers, young lieutenants, and he said, um, get off the bridge. One of them went down the starboard side and was killed by a shell. The other guy, Lieutenant Gay, the officer of the watch, went down the port side and survived the war. Waller was last seen with his hands uh, on the bridge rail, leaning over and looking down at the guns, silent guns on the, on the forecastle below him. And it's probable that he was blown away by a shell which hit the bridge shortly thereafter. But yes, he went down with the ship in the fine tradition. The men that were able to swim to somewhere or who, who were picked up, were they all brought into Japanese captivity after that, Mike? Yeah, they, they all ended up as prisoners of the Japanese, mostly on Java. Some of them made the most incredible efforts to escape. Two separate groups managed to get hold of boats, one a lifeboat and so on, and, and tried to sail all, eventually with the aim of sailing to Australia. And that journey itself was an incredible odyssey. Some of them survived for 13 days before they were captured. Uh, 13 days? Yeah, the, That's the, a bunch of them in a lifeboat, which they christened HMA as Anzac, tried to make it all the way around to southern Java. They ate what they could. They found bits of biscuit. They, they would go ashore on islands and maybe pick up a few you know, wild tomatoes, that sort of thing, drinking rainwater that, that they might be able to catch in an old tin can and so on. But eventually they were captured too. So all those that survived the sinking in the first two or three days were captured by the Japanese. F four of them were killed by Javanese villagers. Uh, their end is a bit lost in the mists of history, if you like. But most of them ended up as P Japanese POWs. And most of them, although not all, most of, the, of those guys ended up on the Burma Siam Railway. Some of them, two of them went to that infamous uh, Sandakan camp in Borneo. Uh, some of them were held in, uh, in Sumatra. Most went first to uh, Java, then to Changi, then to the, uh, the railway. And quite a few of them uh, were then sent on later on to Japan to work as slaves in, in coal mines and, uh, and factories there. That itself is an amazing story too, isn't it, Mike? The conditions the men were brought to Japan in after having the railway was completed yeah. and they were brought to Japan. And, of course, their empire was shrinking all the time while this they, was going They endured enormous atrocities on, on the railway, unspeakable stuff. But they... They survived it with an incredible amount of Australian spirit. What, 19... do, you, what do you mean by that when you well, say Australian 1943, spirit? Well, in, in the midst of this horror and misery on the railway, first Tuesday in November, what do you reckon they did? 
I staged a Melbourne Cup. I really, they convinced the Japanese it was an ancient Australian religious festival. <laughs> and they, and they, they made horses out of bamboo and they somehow got jockey silks and they had clerks of the course and stewards and bookmakers and so on. So they, they retained that magnificent Australian larrikin spirit of mateship. And you talk to any of them, and I will tell you with deep pride, they will tell you that mateship got them through. As you said, uh, some of them were packed off to Japan. And there's an, another astonishing story in that too. The Americans by that time were very much winning the war, 1944. And the Japanese empire was in retreat. They simply couldn't sustain it. Uh, and the Japs were in deep trouble. One convoy of, of what they call them hell ships because they were packed so tightly into the holds of these ships, they were like sardines. One convoy was torpedoed in, uh, in 1944, September 44, uh, by the Americans. I mean, the Americans had no idea they were prison ships. They just saw a Japanese convoy. And that was one of the most staggering stories of the war. M most of them are Australian Army. There are, there are a few Perth blokes there too, but most of them are Army. But one ship called the Rakuya Maru was torpedoed on that night. Didn't sink uh, all that quickly, actually, so most, most of the guys got overboard. A few of them seized lumps of 4B2 and swam around the water bashing any Japanese they could see. <laughs> but then it got really serious, and many men died in the water. And bear in mind, these were emaciated, sick men, some of them, you know, half their normal weight, often with festering tropical sores, malnourished. And for six days, many of them floated around in the sea of corpses, uh, men going insane from drinking seawater. Some men were quite literally murdered so, because they were, they were threatening to kill their mates on the rafts and so on. They tipped over the side for the safety of the others. Some tried to drink their own urine, some tried to drink the blood of, of, of their dead mates to get some sort of form of water. There's a fellow called Blood Bancroft. He was a West Australian fellow. You better explain where he got his nickname from yeah, after he said that. Red, red hair. hair. Yeah, everyone okay. in the Navy had nicknames. Yeah. Yeah. They all had a nickname of some sort or another. He was, he was called Blood because of his shock of flaming red hair. He's a kid of 19. After six days, I'm cutting the story quite short, but um, after six days, an American submarine surfaced near them and they... Um, they could see the American sailors lined up on the casing, the, you know, the foredeck of this sub, with machine guns. They thought, oh, God, they're going to shoot us. Americans thought they were Japanese. So they yelled out some classic Australian swear words, which I won't give you on, you know, family radio. But um, we're effing Australians, and you effing Yanks had better effing get over it. It was fairly convincing proof that they weren't Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually the sub came over, and, and, and Blood Bancroft was the last bloke to scramble on board. Largely, he insisted on trying to do it under his own steam, although he was helped by one of the Yanks. And he'd been a really fit young fellow. He'd been a football player, cricketer. He weighed, you know, would have been 90, 100 kilos at his fighting weight. He was down to about 40. He'd been blackened by... They were covered in fuel oil, stinking rotten fuel oil. They'd been blackened by the sun. They, they had often had, you know, skin injuries, ulcers and that sort of thing. Parched, starving. He was a wreck, you know, barely recognisable as a human figure. But he made it onto the deck of this submarine and he came to attention and he saluted and he could see the captain of the American sub up on the bridge on the conning tower of the submarine. He saluted and he said, Ordinary seaman Arthur Bancroft, Royal Australian Navy, request permission to come on board, sir. Proper naval courtesy. That is one of the most courageous things I've ever heard of. What a classy guy. And he's still alive. Blood is still alive. I saw him in Perth uh, a few weeks ago. He's still going strong. He's still got this beautiful sense of humour. What, what happened when they came home, Mike? The men, the men who'd survived, and how many had survived who'd set out all those years uh, ago on the Autolycus? 600 681 men on board the ship the night she was sunk. 218 eventually made it back. It's, um, I think it's 150-something who, who died in captivity, either from beatings or, uh, or disease or, or illness. When they got home... Nobody had any idea in those days of, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder or anything like that. They were basically told, look, try and forget all about it. And their families were told, look, don't, don't talk to them about it because, you know, it'll, you know, just try and help them get over it a bit. And they, they felt utterly lost and alone. They, they felt they couldn't share these experiences with their girlfriends or their, their mothers or whatever. They were just... How, how could they possibly relate to someone who'd been living at home? They could These extraordinary scenes they you're couldn't. talking about. One bloke, one bloke, a fellow called Ray Parkin, the ship's quartermaster, got back and he, he was welcomed home in the village uh, to his, you know, his little suburb in Footscray, it was, in Melbourne, actually. 